Well, I don't know this morning how many of you here have ever been in a motor vehicle accident. Give me a show of hands. Ever been in a fender, bender, or maybe bigger? I certainly have been. And there are a number of such accidents that stand out in my mind. One is uh, when we first came here a good number of years ago now, maybe we had been here for about five years, there was a year we had three accidents all in a row, all in one year. And lest you think, what kind of drivers are you people? I want you to know that none of those was our fault. People just did not happen to like us and uh, made an effort at hitting our car. But the accident that most stands out in my mind happened very early in my ministry when we were still living in Alberta. We had, as I recall, gone to Edmonton for some shopping. We're coming back late in the day. It was getting dark. Uh, the roads were snow-covered and rather slippery, and so I was driving pretty carefully on a four-lane highway when the car behind me decided it was time to pass. And so he did. But when he came up to where we were on the road, he spun out of control. And when he did, he nosedived right into the side of my car, knocking us off the road and into the ditch. And I remember the crunch. It's always the crunch when you get hit. Ever notice how loud those crunches are? But what most amazed me about that and what I remember to this day was the was the peacefulness of that slide into the ditch. It was like angels were holding on to our car on both ends. This was before the days of seatbelt. Our oldest two boys were with us. They were standing up in the back of the car, and they didn't even get knocked over by our slide into the ditch. Life turns on big what-ifs. And when I'm in that kind of situation, I always get a little philosophical, and I ask the big what-if question. What if we hadn't taken that route? What if I left a minute earlier? Do you ever do that? What if I left a minute later? What if I had driven a little slower, a little faster? What if we hadn't stopped for gas? What if? Again, you see, life can drastically alter just by those momentous occasions that make us ask, what if? And of course the opposite is true as well, because sometimes what ifs save our lives. I remember a number of years ago, Deborah and I were uh, driving on Myra Street uh, going west and had to stop for the traffic light where it intersects with North Front Street. That's where the little Chamber of Commerce log cabin is. We were chattering away, and so when the light light changed, instead of uh, stepping on the gas and going through the intersection, I was just sort of easing my way into the intersection, almost like a hesitation, and that probably saved our lives. Because as I was easing into that intersection, there was a car going down south on North Front Street that ran the red light at full speed. Never braked before the light, never braked after the light. I'm pretty convinced that he never saw that the light was there. A fraction of a moment later, earlier, we would have been T-boned and either seriously injured or not with you today. What if? And in the little drama that uh, Rick and uh, William did for us, they raised the question of what if the shepherds had not responded to the gospel message in the way they did. And in the time that we have this morning, I want to turn it upside down a little bit and talk with you for a bit about what if Jesus had not come? What if Christmas had not taken place? How would that impact your lives and my life today? Well, obviously, in a number of significant ways, one of the ways in which it would impact us is we'd have a different calendar, wouldn't we? We wouldn't be talking about 2011 moving into 2012 because history in the Western world is divided at the birth of Christ. We talk about B.C. and we talk about A.D. B.C. before Christ, A.D. standing for what? 
Anno Domino, the year of our Lord. And uh, in this day and age where people are, you know, often sort of in an antichrist spirit trying to get, get, get rid of Christ out of Christmas, and we talk about holiday season and festive trees and all of that kind of stuff, they're even trying to change the designation of B.C. and A.D. Did you know that? People don't like to have history divided by the birth of Christ. And so they've come up with a new designation. It's called C.E. and B.C.E. Have you ever heard those designations? C.E. stands for the Common Era. And B.C.E. stands for Before the Common Era. And I find it kind of humorous that for all their attempts at getting Christ out of there, they still can't quite get rid of B.C. And so every time I look at it, I say, you know, before Christ's era and Christ's era, you call it whatever you want. We have that spirit of Antichrist. But more than that, if Christ had not been born, you and I wouldn't be here today for the purposes and the reasons that we all are. Because what unites us, of course, is the reality of the birth, the, the life, the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We might, some of us, be together for other reasons, but we certainly wouldn't be here to celebrate this occasion and this event. But you know, more importantly than all of that, the birth of Christ is significant because if he had not been born, there would not be a permanent solution to all that ails the human race. And you know just as well as I do that when, you've, that when you've lived life for a little while in this world, that for all the pleasures and all the joys and all the good things that we experience, this world is nevertheless a place where there is often much pain and much suffering. We live at a time where the world economy continues to shake. It used to be uh, major recessions would come, what, every 10, 20 years? Now they're starting to come every two or three years. People talk about the possible collapse of the whole economic system. Obviously, there is something wrong underneath that has not been fixed. You cannot continue to outspend yourself as nations and as peoples of the world any more than any of us can individually without getting into a lot of trouble. And with economic stress comes social unrest almost inevitably. And we've all watched the news, the, you know, brutal repression that's happening in Syria and the celebration of what's known as the Arab Spring in other Middle East countries. And we're reminded again, it's far easier to criticize and to tear down existing regimes, however wicked they may be, than it is to build a new society and a new civilization and the price is always a tremendous amount of bloodletting. And then there is war and rumors of war and natural disasters. Last weekend, what, over a thousand people in the Philippines washed away with flood rains unprecedented for that area. The Americans and the Canadians were all proud of being able to pull our troops out of Iraq. But I'll have you know that Iraq right now is on the verge of another civil war as the, the Shiites and the Sunnis fight for power. In fact, the president, who is of one tribe, has put out an arrest order for his vice president, who happens to represent another tribe. And then we haven't even talked yet about the personal struggles that all of us face sooner or later health issues, financial issues, relational issues, places where we're lost, places where we're confused. And the Bible says the reason for all of that is not because God is nasty, but because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And most of us here this morning know the gospel well enough to know that when God first created Adam and Eve, he created them in a love relationship. He said to them, love me, trust me, obey you, and every blessing that I can give you, I will pour out upon you. 
unfortunately listening to the serpent, and they decided they could have their cake and eat it too. They not only didn't want to trust God, they didn't think they needed to, but more importantly, they decided they didn't have to listen to him. And so they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in so doing, they introduced sin into the world. And by sin came death. The day that you eat thereof, God said to them, concerning the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And since then, death has spread through all creation, and every last one of us experiences its pull sooner or later. Sometimes it takes the form of that sense of emptiness that we all feel when, when our fondest dreams come true, and then we say, is this all there is? I remember being in college thinking when we were in one of these, you know, interminable examination sessions that you had, I'd say to myself, wouldn't it be, oh, won't I love this when it's finally over. And then it's over and you say, okay, now so what? It shows up in the places of shame and guilt that all of us experience by times when we violate what we know to be the moral standard. Every last one of us, you know, whether saint or sinner, we, in the back of our mind, have a certain standard of, of what we should be doing and how we ought to be doing it. And, and when we fail, the result is shame and the result is guilt. And if guilt is feeling badly for what we've done, then shame is feeling that we're just messed up. I don't have what it takes. And we spiral down and not infrequently we just give ourselves over to whatever it is that has captured us because what's the use? I can't win it anyway. And then there is that, that whole living with the consequences of the choices that we've made. And you don't have to be very old before you discover it's a lot easier to get into trouble than to get out of trouble. Ever notice that? And it's accumulative. You make one decision. It leads you astray. You make another decision. And before you know it, you're desperately lost. And I've often thought the human race is like a boy, teenage boy, living at home, tired of listening to his dad, tired of having to, to submit to his parental authority. And he says, I don't need this. I'm big enough to go out into the world on my own. And, and so, you know, he packs his little lunch and he uh, packs his little suitcase and he heads out into life only to discover that life out there is much tougher than he thought. The food that he took for granted when he sat around his father's table, he now has to go out and find that lunch that he packed. It doesn't last very long. And the protection and the security that he enjoyed in his father's house, the bed that he could sleep in, and knowing that nobody could touch him because his father was his protection, all of that now is gone, and he discovers that out there in the woods, it's scary, and it's dark, and there's a lot of monsters, and there's a lot of noises, and he has to be in his guard all the time. And he has to protect himself now against a world that is trying to take from him. And so the result is that he has to depend on his own effort and his energy, and the deeper he gets into the woods, the more lost he becomes. And the end of that is death. And one of the realities of sin is nobody escapes this world alive. And we've been reminded again uh, this past week with Peter Dornboss's very sudden passing uh, how imminent death can be and how quickly it can take us. He suffered a brain aneurysm on Wednesday night around 7.30 and died 24 hours later in the hospital. And as you know, and it's in the bulletin, our funeral uh, is being held on Tuesday. It's appointed, says Scripture, unto all men once to die. Many of you will remember Christopher Hitchens, one of the most virulent atheists of modern times, wrote the book, God is Not Great, uh, was proudly anti-Christ, uh, came down with cancer a number of months ago, died a week ago this past Thursday. And uh, I mention that not to point fingers at him, but to point out that 
Prior to his death, you will recall, he went on record as saying that Christians were hoping and praying for his conversion, but that if he ever sounded like he was was changing his opinion about his anti-God views, not to take him seriously because it was either the drug speaking or his drug addled brain. And so he died as he lived in defiant rebellion of God the Most High. It is appointed unto men and women one day to die. And that's the reality of the world we live in. Not a very, you know, uplifting kind of a thing to contemplate on Christmas Day, but it's the reality of the world that we live in. And that's where history would end. That is all we could live for, to get through this life as comfortably, as pleasantly, and as pain-free as possibly, if Jesus had not come. But the good news is that he did come. And he came, not just to make us feel good, but he came to redeem the world, to fix everything that is broken, and to make possible a life of glory beyond what we can ever begin to understand. And again, if you know Scripture, you will know that for thousands of years, God looking on from heaven at where the human race find itself had promised that one day he would redeem the situation. And repeatedly he said, I know this is a mess of your own making. I know it's because you have rebelled and sinned against God, but I love you enough that I'm going to step into the situation. I'm going to send somebody someday who's going to fix this up. And so the Bible says in the fullness of time, God sent his own son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. And because all the problems in the world are caused by that alienation between God and ourselves, this Jesus, when he comes to redeem us, doesn't come with big armies, doesn't come with big solutions to all the world's big ills. No, he comes to deal with the issue of sin. The angel speaking to Joseph said, you will call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sin. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And Jesus comes, out, comes from outside of time and space born of a virgin conceived by the Holy Spirit so that he doesn't share in Adam's corruption. He lives life in total obedience to God. And you've often heard me say he loved God above all, loved his neighbor even as he loved himself, never ever sinned, was like us in all things sins accepted, overcame every temptation and difficulty that you and I could ever face died on the cross, not for his own sin, but for the sins of all the rest of us. Rose from the dead because there was no sin that could hold him down. Was raised up at the right hand of God the Father, sat down at his right hand, King of kings and Lord of lords, and then he has poured out his Holy Spirit. And the message of the gospel, the message of Christmas taken in its entirety, is that when our eyes get opened to our sin and misery, when we understand that all the troubles the world experiences are fundamentally rooted in our alienation from God and our need to be restored, even while we cannot restore ourselves, but our eyes are open to behold the glory of Jesus and we come to him in repentance and faith, then the most amazing transformation takes place. Because not only are our sins forgiven, not only don't we have to pay and pay and pay or live with the consequences of the stupid things that we've done, we get a brand new beginning. And not only that, but Jesus comes to live in us by his Holy Spirit. We get restored in our relationship with God, and then from the inside out, he begins to change our lives. He teaches us what it is to love God what it is to love our neighbor. 
What it is to take responsibility for our stuff? What is other people's responsibility? And then as we begin to practice that reality in our homes and in our businesses, in our relationships and in our communities, what you get all over the world is these small pockets of light. People who are reflecting heaven's values on earth. And while all of this is only limited and imperfect, and won't come to the fullest expression until Jesus comes the second time where he breaks every power of sin. By the Holy Spirit, he gives us a foretaste. And I believe that one of the reasons even the world likes to celebrate Christmas, beside all its commercial aspects, and, you know, it's because it, it gives people a moment of hope. It feeds that magical longing for peace on earth and goodwill towards man. And every so often in the course of history, you'll have one of those events that illustrates what happens when the Christmas message really takes root in people's lives. I want to finish with one more story that illustrates the power of the gospel to give us hope even in times of great difficulty. Think back to your high school or college English classes. How many of you remember the name Henry Wadsworth Longfellow? Some scholars have. He wrote a poem that subsequently became a Christmas carol known as I Heard the Bells of Chris on Christmas Day. Have you ever heard that song? It goes like this. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and mild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Like many poems and many songs, there is a fascinating history. To this because life was good for Longfellow and his family in the early 1860s. His wife and he had been married in 1843. They were the privileged parents of five lovely children. As I said, life was good, but then came 1861 and life went to south real fast. April of that year was the beginning of the American Civil War a war that would eventually cost a million soldiers' lives and rent the very fabric of the United States of America. But in July of that year, his wife Fanny was cutting the hair of her seven-year-old daughter Edith and was wanting to preserve her locks by binding it together with molten wax. Well, an accident happened one way or the other. Wax got on her dress, caught fire, and she became a blazing pillar almost immediately, ran screaming to her husband who was asleep in the next bedroom. He tried to put it out. He didn't have a big enough mat to wrap her in. He got seriously burned. But she was so badly injured, she died the next day. As you can imagine, Christmas that year was not a very happy occasion for Longfellow. He wrote in his diary how inexpressibly sad are all holidays. And then the following year at the anniversary of her death he said again in his diary, I can make no record of these days, better leave them wrapped in silence perhaps someday God will give me peace. And Christmas of that year, now 1862, he wrote a Merry Christmas, say the children, but that is no more, 
for me. Then in 1863, his oldest son, Charles, who had enlisted with the Union Army over his father's objection in November of that year, got seriously wounded by gunshot, came home to recover. Some stories indicate that he died, but he didn't really. But as you can imagine, that added to Longfellow's sorrow. And interestingly enough and predictably enough, in 1863, there is no diary entry from him at all. But then the next year came around, and then his faith began to revive. Lincoln had been reelected in a surprising landslide in November of that year. The war was moving towards its conclusion, and uh, in fact ended on April the 9th of 1865. Abraham Lincoln, interestingly enough, was assassinated five days later by John Wilkes Booth, who represented the Confederate forces and who thought that if he could kill Lincoln and two other high officials in the government, chaos would ensue and the Southern nation would still rise up and win the war. That clearly was not to be. But it was in that context then, on Christmas Day, of 1864 that he wrote these words then pealed the bells more loud and deep God is not dead nor doth he sleep the wrong shall fail the right prevail with peace on earth goodwill to men Father I'm so keenly aware on a morning like this that in a crowd like this there are many different groups of people represented. There are some of us here, and life's just been good. And Lord, when life is good, sometimes we're tempted to think it's because we've been good, or we've done it well, or we're smarter than other people. And in those moments, we need to realize and we need to understand that everything that we have is a gift from you. And so if we find ourselves in that place today, then we pray together that, that you would help us to give thanks to you and honor you and share the good things that you've given us with other people around us. Also keenly aware, Lord, that on a day like today, there are those of us for whom the pain of loneliness and the pain of loss and the pain of emptiness is greater than ever. And we can't wait until a season like this is over and we can go on with the rest of life. Help us to know when we're in those places that you care. That in fact you cared so much that you sent your Son and that through him you've granted us your Holy Spirit, that you place us in family and that you place us in community. And may we, know, Lord, know through your Spirit and through each other the comfort that only you can provide and the hope that one day you will wipe away every tear. And then, Lord, there are those of us here. Uh, life's been pretty tough. And uh, we wonder if we're ever going to get out of this cycle of trouble or disaster. And when we find ourselves in that kind of place, it's so easy to think, well, you're not there, or you don't care, or we're so bad that we're beyond redemption. And help us, Lord, in that place to know and to understand afresh that you sent your Son as a demonstration of your incredible love, and that tears may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And we pray that you give us faith to hold on and to persevere knowing that in the Lord our work will not be in vain. And Lord, then there's some of us here, we've gone to church for a long, long time, and we've heard messages and we sing songs, but, but Lord, we feel that we just don't have what it takes to be the kind of Christian that we know that we should be. We're just wired wrong, 
Our disposition is what it is. We don't know how to change ourselves. We say things that are stupid. We say things that are hurtful. We fall into patterns of sin that we don't know how to break. And Lord, we've come to a place where we just sort of get hopeless. And we say, what use is it? I'll never change. And Lord, when we're in that place, I pray that by your word and by your spirit, you would stir that flame deep in our hearts that says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus. And Lord, help us to come without pretense and without fig leaves, just honestly confessing the deepest and the darkest places of our lives, knowing that in Christ you've paid the price and in Christ you've granted victory. And as we cling to you, you can do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. And Lord, there's some of us, we look at the big picture in the world and we wonder, what kind of a world is this that I'm bringing my child into? A place where the future is so uncertain. The place where who's going to look after me in my old age? How am I ever going to make ends meet? What will happen to me when I get old? And I pray, Lord, that in those places we might experience afresh the everlasting arms of our God and Father. And we think so much this morning of Grace Dornboss and her family as they mourn the loss of Peter. And we so pray, Lord, that you in every way will be their encouragement and their comfort. And Lord, as, as we seek to put one foot in front of the other and live out life in the world, may we do so with a testimony of faith that you've entered into history and that while this world continues to groan under the travail of sin, soon and very soon, you're going to come and you're going to fix it all up. And so help us to focus our eyes on Jesus. And even now as we worship him, Lord, may we just have our minds blown open and our hearts enlarged at what an incredible gift that you've given. And may we experience a fresh, in a whole brand new way in the year that lies before us, the resurrection power of Jesus that has overcome death in hell. Oh Lord, we love you and we want to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your life, Lord. Thank you for your stand together. Seated on the throne, we crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious. High and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the promised Messiah. Born to 